Hello everyone and welcome back for a new video. This video is a special FAQ for the 10,000 subscriber that we recently crossed. So I want to thank every single one of you. So 10,000 thank you. And uh, as the saying goes by, let's begin. So first question is from Blade Strike 8045. Question for a 10K, 10K Q&A. Started to develop pain in my brachioradialis muscle portion closest to the elbow when I do pressure hammer curls. Sharpest at the bottom portion when arm is parallel to the floor. Also, get a faint feeling when I squeeze it against my biceps, like the top portion of a dumbbell row. Only on the left arm, right is totally solid. The pain does get better if I do a set of warm-up with baby weights before my working sets, but it doesn't go away. It always appears in the next workout. Any advice? Thank you for your question. So, to um, do a quick synthesis. Dude is doing some preacher curl with very low incline, like that. And he gets pain right here. Right there, and when he's doing dumbbell row or this kind of motion, it's also hurting right there. So, um, my advice is to stop doing the exercise since it's hurting you. And also, uh, picture curl are not supposed to be done with a arm angle parallel to the floor. So, I advise you to actually use a very inclined bench or to uh, use another kind of grip uh, for you. Because preacher hammer curl are extremely stressful on both the brachialis and the brachioradialis, and it's not really some kind of position that you are used to uh, normally, so you have to get conditioned to this. So the sheer fact it's um, painful for you tells me that you are just not conditioned and ready for that lift. So that's about it. Just switch and um, do not do this kind of preacher, preacher angle. All right, next question. Game02 asks, congrats on hitting your goals, brother. Thank you. In one of your YouTube short name, don't be lazy with your isolation work. You were using momentum on seated biceps curl. From your experience, is it worth performing them over strict form? And is there any, and is there a right time or reason to include them in a program? So thank you for your question. It's actually a good one. Um, so uh, for the short in question, I was showing off with 20 kilo dumbbell. So like basically 64 pounds, which is kind of heavy. And the momentum was because it was the last set and I was uh, pretty tired at the time. So the stricter you are on your isolation, the better. But at the same time, any kind of momentum that can help you perform better reps and get you closer to a real type of productive failure point is also good. And when you're doing heavy curl, dumbbell, barbell, whatever, the hardest portion is right at the bottom, right? It's when you're right here and you need to go up. So actually using a bit of momentum like that to just get those first 15, 20 degrees to get here and then finish the movement like that and then slowly descending and doing, using this kind of motion like that to get the other going. So this kind of pretty smooth going movement is actually quite uh, productive to get your biceps a nice intensive workout. Uh, if it does not work for you, don't do it. That's it. But the closer you are to getting failure on the uh, targeted muscle, whatever if it's compound or isolation, the better. And on isolation, things like lateral, lateral raises, dumbbell curls, um, tricep extension also, you can use some momentum or some kind of shoulder movement to get a better workout. All right, next question. David Do Carmo Cabral 2989 asks, that's incredible, what's your risk with measurement? So he's talking about the post where I asked people to ask a question where I showed that I had a, I reached a 45, 40, yeah, 45 centimeter arm measurement. And he asked, what's your wrist measurement? It's, I'm not going to squish too much. It's 19.5. So I guess it's a bit above 17, uh, 7 inches. 14, 16, yeah, that's it. Like 7, seven inches and a quarter, uh, or 15, something. So there you go. George Sarias asks, I recently saw Jeff Albert post that the way for Natis is not to build and cut cycle, instead bulk maintain, bulk maintain until you get huge and then cut. What are your thoughts? Uh, I do not know who Jeff Albert is, except if you're talking about like uh, Alberto Nunes. Um, 
I mean, if the goal is to absolutely maximize size, and yes, if you are someone that needs to be shredded or lean for some other stuff, like for photo shoots or you're doing some competitions, for example, uh, you'll have to cut at some point. So, uh, in a general kind of advice, I'd say, yeah. Uh, and at the same time, this type of uh, cycles is technically also a bulking and cutting cycle because you bulk, so you gain some muscle and fat, but then you maintain. But by maintaining and doing recomposition, what is going to happen? You're going to, yes, more, much more slower, but you're still going to lose some fat and still kind of gain some muscle. And when you're lean enough, you will go in the bulk again. So what he's saying is basically just to say bulk and cut cycles, but with a little twist. And that twist is to not over bulk or over lean out. So it, it's kind of the same thing, at least how you present it. So yeah. Next question, 5space666 asks, should I deload every 6 to 12 weeks? If you feel like it, and you feel like it, uh, and that it seems to have some kind of positive effect on you in your training, yes. If not, no. It depends on the training. If it's strength-wise, most likely you will need it. Um, if it's for hypertrophy, it's not supposed to be. Or at least, we aren't really sure, and it seems to not be like a clear cut yes or no qu question. Luca. 934 ask congrats thanks my question i'm 18 you mentioned in a video that as a young man you should learn how to fight how would you combine this with lifting uh i would do either a very short period where you are doing three times per week some combat sport and three times per week some training but it would be low stress option low volume and it would be a very short period of time just to get you going and or I would do three times per week bodybuilding training stuff and once per week some combat sport. At least when you get used to it, you know. Or I would do twice a week uh, combat sport. One real session, one much more technical drill, low stress stuff like shadow boxing, etc. Uh, while the training will be like upper lower or full body and you just train two to three times per week. It depends on your end goal, actually. Um, but if you have you said, should learn how to fight. So I would guess you are 18 and you do not know how to fight. In that context, there is an argument that you could go basically every day into combat sport practice. Uh, and by every day, I mean there will be days, like once or twice per week, where it will be some kind of hard session. And all the other sessions will be you alone or you with some friends, where you will do some um, drills that are, like there is no impact, no risk, nothing at all. And you will just be implementing good technique and good rhythm and good habits to learn easier some stance, how to throw a punch. You can do some shadow boxing, you can have a rope and work on your head movement, your torso movement, your stepping, everything I just said. You can have a, a mirror to shadow boxing and each time you know you're pulling a punch, you are supposed to move your head like that or like this. You can work on some combos as well. Um, you can do, if, if we are talking about ground work, grappling, wrestling stuff, you can do something which is called, I think in English, would be flow, flowing, where you just, like with a guy, you know, and you're just doing like some stuff, and when you, when you, are, when you manage to have some kind of uh, hold, or you can begin some kind of lock, you stop, you know, it's just kind of always getting in movement, right? And all of this stuff is also extremely well um, managed for your cardio level. It will I increase your cardio capacity, your lung capacity, extremely fast and extremely high. Um, because wrestling and combat sport, I mean, they are uh, cardio-wise, are some of the most gruesome thing you can experience. But then you're covered, right? When I was doing very regular boxing, uh, just a few years back, actually, uh, my only cardio work would be walking and HIT sprints on hills. And two months after. I had began to do boxing, those heel sprint <laughs> would be a walk in the park because it was so easy. Because boxing was so hard compared to it that, I mean, heel sprint were just like, you know, I was nearly having fun. <laughs> so that's how we do it, man. Good luck. Do not get injured. Next question, it vibes. Congrats on 10K and the arm both well up. Thank you, man. Maybe some potential video ideas. Uh, what I did to get almost 18 inches, all right, how to set up a diet that best suits your genetics. 
You are actually allowed to ask me that. Okay, I'll see what I can do. I personally would also like you to explain why and how when someone should use low rep, high rep, let's set, low rest approach, lifting vlogs, these are fun, okay? Dance off between you and me. <laughs> Alright, <laughs> okay, I can promise that one. Alright. Hey, I'm back. Um, <clears throat> for you, it's just an instant, but actually, for me, it's 24 hours because I lacked the storage space on my um, camera. So I had to actually uh, wait 24 hours, make some room and stuff, to go back. So yeah let's start let's uh, restart where i left all right so the next question was from daniel haldieri most people have a few muscle groups that respond well to training do you think that the muscle are lacking are just trained incorrectly and could you hang with their bigger muscle if trained adequately or even pass them i mean i'm pretty sure he meant surpass them if you have a juicy muscle can you bring your whole body to the level to that level of becoming juicy i love you love you too bro thank you for your question so uh, what you refer to, basically, I think are heavy, uh, easy responder muscle and kind of small, weaker, not that much responding muscle. So basically strong point and weak point. And my take on it is that your weak point can definitely get up par with your strong point and even surpass them. Most often, when you have a weak point, it's not a real issue. It is a functional issue. First, it is maybe because you had some kind of a sportive athletic background so you are used to use some kind of muscle but not others and when these muscles are agonist meaning that they participate into the same kind of uh, biomechanic function for example the glute and the hamstring both help with the hip extension well if you have huge glutes which is my case it is easy for your body to say you know what just use our glutes you know and you know the hamstring yeah well you are very kind of use them, right, but it's not the same thing, right? So you end up, as I have ended up for quite a few years and I'm still at that time uh, kind of balancing out, you end up with huge glutes, powerful glutes, and weak, uh, small hamstring. So that's the first thing, there is a functional issue, but actually proper programming and proper training can fix this. The second issue would be you who lacks the mind-muscle connection and the habit of using the muscle. For example, many persons that the plague of beginners are that they do bench press and they don't feel the chest. Now, of course, feeling a muscle is not required to get it in bigger, but the problem is uh, much more deep. And in that sense, it's because they do not know how to use their chest. They do not know how to recruit them. They do not know how to do this kind of motion where you are adducting the elbow in regard to the torso while flexing the chest fibers, right? And that was something I couldn't do when I started. So when I would be doing my bench press um, sets between chest, between sets, I would be doing that, you know, and clenching my fist, you see, to do this, to flex my, my chest, to actually learn how to actually use it. And then I would try to do kind of the same thing under the weight. So when you have this kind of issue, it is just a matter of training the muscle enough with enough isolation and proper exercise where you are able to move the weight with the muscle and then to rinse repeat, be patient and get used to uh, uh, work this muscle with big weight on compounds and that's it. So yes, definitely your muscles that are subpar can very easily uh, grow up and catch back on those very hub power muscle and even surpass them. And then when it's about balancing your physique and choosing what you want to have bigger and less big and what you want to focus and less focus, it's you and your personal choice. Yes, bone structure and muscle length, you know, with the tendon attachment can more or less influence that, but at the end of the day, for most of us, except if you have really extra long or extra short muscle, you do what you want with your body. Just like me, for example, I had a weak chest, weak point chest, then I caught it up, but at the same time, I'm not really interested in having a very big chest. I like to have like a some upper chest, a very balanced square chest look, just like the silver air, but between a very huge chest like Arnold and having humongous arm and very wide clavicle, such as, for example, Steve Reeves, um, I would rather have those humongous arm and very wide shoulder, like Steve Reeves, but it's just my own personal thing, you know? So there you go. Um, 
Orgolan asks, congrats on the 10k, thank you. My question is what's the meaning of the name Ersoviak? So, there is not actually a real meaning, or at least if there is one, I have not found it yet. I actually uh, chose this pseudonym because of a dream. When I was like 11 or 12, I um, made a dream and I was basically a Viking, you know, so I like the axe shield and I jump off a boat, you know, there are others, you know, and we go into like a shield wall fight and then there is a fray and everything, and we're fighting. And at some point, someone shout Ersoviak, and I turned around. Um, and then it's all messy, there is like smoke, fire, there is some fur and everything. Uh, and then I wake up and I'm like, wow, damn, you know, and it's stuck. So when I subscribed on Instagram and on YouTube, and they say, oh, what pseudo do you want? Ersoviak is nice. That's basically where I came from. So there you go. All right, Alex V six E Z ask nucleus overload protocol to blow up the arm. Uh, nucleus overload training for arm. So you train your arm every day with isolation work, um, low rest, high rep, and rinse repeat for four to six weeks, and uh, that should be it. Good luck. Ayin Mohammadi ask hey, so congratulations on the take a sub. Thanks, bro. What are some methods you recommend for body weight training? As I said, down workouts as many reps as possible. Love the video. Thank you for your question. Very good question. Um, all right. So for body weight training, I'm going to assume that we are not talking about any kind of added weight because, of course, for body weight training, one very good way to make it more efficient is to add weight. Do weighted pull up, weighted dips, weighted push ups, and so on and so forth. Squat. Squat is technically a body weight movement. You put a barbell with weights, and all of a sudden you have a weighted squat, right? So, about cluster sets, I would think this is a great uh, thing when you are either learning a strength skill, for example, doing one arm push up, uh, one arm inverted row, one arm pull up, handstand push ups, um, for like exercise that needs to be extremely intense, but where posture or balance or just overall strength level is still subpar to keep you from doing like normal rep range, normal amount of sets. So. Uh, pistol squat also, Nordic and string curl, things like this, cluster set would respond very well, uh, in my opinion, to that need. Down workout, so for some of you who do not know down workout, you basically choose a number of reps, let's say 30, so you do 30 push-ups, then you rest a bit, then you do 29 push-ups, you rest a bit, 28, 27, 26, and so on and so forth, until you get to 1. And you do that with the same... Uh, I'm unsure about this, so you need to check out, but I'm pretty sure that then the rest in between is the number of reps you just did in seconds. So you do 30 reps, you rest 30 seconds, then 29. So you rest 29, 28, and so on and so forth. So there is a huge density aspect here. So you do a lot of work in a very short amount of time. And I do believe that for most exercise, when you have a pretty intermediate level, so let's say you can do a lot of dips, you can do a lot of push-ups, a lot of uh, pull-ups as well, this type of training is extremely well when you do not have uh, well well adjusted when you do not have enough time or you just want like some kind of finisher, right? And for the as many reps as possible, same thing. I would think that it is extremely good as a standalone thing when you are doing some finisher or you are doing any kind of normal training with weight and stuff, and you just want to have some kind of low stress uh, finisher, and then like doing some as many reps as possible diamond push-ups. Uh, or CC squats, you know, things like this. This is a great idea. So this is my take on it. All right. Sean Colvin asks, question, what do you recommend doing in order for the plates to be stable when in the back rather than in the front? For queuing more back engagement like you recommended, because I feel like in the belt in the gym always is unstable, slippery. When I have a belt in the reverse like you, thought my rep count is similar. Also, thank you for providing some of the really stepping night to YouTube, the next era of history will be insane due to YouTube players like you. Thank you, man, and yes, that's the goal. We need to have the next generation to be much better than us. So, we are counting on you, bros. Um, now, regarding the question, you, he posted that onto my upper body training part two, so I'm pretty sure he's referring to uh, the pull-ups. And for the pull-ups, what I do is that I put the weight with a chain, and the waist, the weight are the plates are hanging between my legs. But when I set up, I actually put them behind my legs, right? <clears throat> so he's asking me why, and is there a way to make it better? So the reason why is very simple. I will make a full explanation, like on the weighted chin-up tutorial, how to get strong to weighted chin-up, and etc. Um, 
The reason is simple. When you're doing pull-ups, there is a bar and you are actually pulling yourself up. So there is either this kind of motion when you're doing a chin-up or this kind of motion when you're doing a pull-up, right? So if you have the weights between your legs, the weights are sl slightly forward actually. So when you're going to get up, the weights are going to do that. So when you get down, they're going to do that. And this pendulum thing will exhaust you. You will actually need to squeeze really hard your legs, your glutes. You, you will have to tighten your core extremely hard just to keep the weight from moving. This is not going to make you stronger. This is not going to make you more efficient or whatever. So this is a waste, a huge waste at that, of focus and energy. On an exercise with already something that is literally making the calorie explode all around your body, right? Putting the, the plates forward, right? Blocking them forward you, like in front of your, of your shin, for example. It would be a good idea if the goal was to actually work your core because you would have to constantly fight a weight that is forcing you to extend your spine, so you'd have to really clench hard onto your abs, um, and it will also better make you focus the lats and the arms, but it would be extremely tiring and uh, anything over like six reps would be cardio. So what do you do when you just want to hammer as hard as possible your back overall with some elbow flexor? You actually put them behind, that way. You're here, the weights are there, the barbell is here, and you're going to pull that way, and never the weight is going to be a problem. Because even if they are pulling you down, they are pulling you down in the same direction that you would have gone anyway, with or without weight. And that's why I do this. And uh, for now, the heaviest I would have uh, been able to do was two reps at four plates, so 80 kg. So four plates is a lot and it's not comfortable at all, but I just did two reps. And the heaviest I've done was 85 kg, so um, 185 pounds, I believe. Uh, but one ugly rep, right? So I do not think this kind of technique can work for extra strong guys that can like do some pull up with five plate because five plate behind you must be a <laughs> must be a pain to set up. But for most of us, I do believe that it is a great uh, idea just to train, and there is no need really to have a weight between your legs when you're doing pull ups, except if you're into street lifting, and then it's part of a rule, right? So there you go, bro. Uh, and to uh, to uh, answer the other question. Uh, I would suggest you get a weight belt with a long chain, you put them just like you would uh, anyway, and then you twist, and then you put them back with your feet, actually with one foot, instead of trying to put the weight, the weight belt forward with the weight behind, because then it's, you have to like set up, grab stuff and everything, it's a, it's a pain in the ass, right? So there you go, bro. ESP Gravy asks, do you go to failure each set or only the last set? I go as close as I can to failure as possible, but I am not the kind of guy who responds very well to real total failure. So my failure checkpoint is the either the uh, concentric or positive part of a lift failure, when I stop when I can do another rep, or and or when I need to when I need to uh, like uh, degrade my execution, my form, my technique to keep going. That's some of the cue I use to stop my lift. So you choose. Technically, no, but actually, yes, right? Captain Zod asks Are you a fan of cable chest fly? Nope, and I do not like to train chest. <laughs> there are some ch chest exercises that I like, like dips and, pull and push ups, for example. I also kind of like some machine press and the, like the peg deck. I mean, I'm trying to kind of get used to it, but I do not like to train chest. So there you go. And cable chest fly, it's the same, I don't like them, right? I, I would prefer to do pullover rather than flies. Kalan Donor asks, Hey, so awesome video, thanks. You talked a lot about possible elbow tendonitis after weighted chin up and pull up. No, I did not. I found weighted wing chin up very natural and comfortable for my elbow. Have you ever tested that one? Uh, yes, I have, and I think you mixed up some stuff. Uh, you asked this on the 10 body, top 10 bodybuilding exercise, so I'm pretty sure you mixed some stuff I said. My elbow tendonitis problem was because of too much triceps isolation. What you are referring is my elbow tendon on the bicep side, the bicep tendon, that would get extremely tired and sore from full range of motion, full supination, heavy weighted chin up with three plate and more. And this has nothing to do with tendonitis. It's about this getting extremely tired while my biceps do not, does not feel anything really after some heavy chin up in supination position. And me, starting to wonder if I'm not at risk of tearing a biceps. And it has happened quite a lot recently in the street lifting community because apparently biomechanic and respecting your own body's limit is not something that we are supposed to do, so there you go. But yeah, weighted ring chin-up are way more comfortable for the elbows 
and I've done them, it's just that uh, they, were, they weren't the issues. But thank you, man. Maximilian Bed asks, do you listen to League of, Magic, League of Legends music? If so, what's your fav? No, I do not. Uh, I've watched Arkane, it was great, and I play Le League of Legends on the phone. Uh, it's called Wild, Wild Rift, so if you want to add me, you can. But uh, no, I don't listen to their music. But there are some music I've seen, like from trailer and, and everything. They're, they're quite nice. They're quite nice. Uh, and then, last question. Jake Good asks, I have a question regarding hamstrings. I've been going harder on them since the last 6 to 12 months, and they are definitely increasing size. But I've noticed my right hamstring has more of a rounded look, while the left feels flatter. Is this due to an imbalance? Strangely, the measurement have a 7 inch legs too. Ever come across this? Also, really enjoying your take on the Natty Bodybuilding community. Thank you, Jake. Really appreciate uh, both the compliment and the question. So, uh, first things first. There is possibly a chance that you did only bilateral work and you have a dominant leg and a weaker leg. And that's why maybe uh, you have this imbalance. The second thing would be that you have actually, actually some very different insertion for your hamstring because you know we are not uh, symmetrical uh, there is always a little difference between two sides of our body like if we were cut in half right not no our face are not extremely um, symmetrical our body like the nipple line uh, the clavicle shape and width uh, the muscle insertion all of that is not symmetrical okay like my my red my left biceps is a bit shorter than my right biceps my left triceps, same, same thing, shorter than my right triceps. Um, so, so many, so many things, right, different. But just a bit. You might have a, a gap of asymmetry that is a bit more noticeable, maybe, compared to the norm, right? So maybe you have a quite long hamstring and a one that is shorter. So what does happen looking like is that you have one with like a, uh, like a ball shape and the other one is very flat. So that could be one thing. And then the other thing would be that maybe you just don't have a good muscle-mind connection with the hamstring and um, the glutes and or the adductors and or the calves could be stealing you some work when you're doing some hip hinge and knee flexion work, which are the only things that can really work well the hamstring. So uh, if that's the case, I would advise you to adjust some exercise, to have exercise where you're really working hard on your hamstring with as little help from the glutes the calves, the erectors too, and the hamstring, and also to do some unilateral work. And also, the fact that the measurements are the same does not mean anything, because uh, you are measuring also the quads and the adductors, and depending on where you are measuring, uh, or what you are measuring how, um, possibly there is some glutes as well, or like hip flexor, right? So. Yet again, uh, you need to actually check the muscle on each leg to be sure, right? So you need to have enough development and be lean enough to see all of that. But again, to give you my own example, my right, no, my left glutes is bigger than the right one, but my right quadriceps is bigger than my left one. But my left adductor is bigger than the right one. So, you know, there is always some kind of very little tiny asymmetry, all right, that you possibly have or do not have, right? And then it's just about you know, um, rectifying it, if it's really something that is worrying you or that could be dangerous or detrimental for your health, long term or short term and your performance as well, or if it's just like look wise, of course, you can also take care of that, right? So that's about it. Um, I'd like to thank again every single one of you for subscribing, watching the video, uh, liking, commenting. Thank you again for all your questions and uh, uh, I'll receive you shortly for others video and for now I'll go train. It's time to do upper body and uh, yeah. If you're training today, tell me what you're doing too and uh, I'll be happy to share with you. Thank you so much for being here. Take care, bye bye.